fired up for communion. Communion is a, a way for everyone in church to share and remember a very important event. The focus now should be on Jesus and his sacrifice and how he treated his followers. Well, while there are so many scriptures, uh, reading and meditations that could be touched upon during communion, it is more important that we speak particularly about the Lord's Last Supper, and that the focus should be on Jesus as a real person. Remember, he, is, he has touched all of us in our daily lives. I mean, every day, Jesus touches us somewhere or another. So, let's go to the Father in prayer. Father God, we're in fact for Jesus who died on that cross that the people as, as we learn more and more how he sacrificed his life and didn't, and, and didn't care. He cared about us so much that he was willing to die for us. So as we take those emblems today, I just, just hope we never forget what they represent. The bread representing 
his body as a cup representing the blood that he shared for us on that cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I have spoken a number of times in reference to communion, and I, I, I realize too that I have probably repeated the words many times. But I can remember the very first time I partook of communion. It was in my home church in Columbus, Indiana. There were a thousand people there on Sunday morning. And I had very little knowledge as to what communion was except that the elders stood at the table, much like we have here, and they had bread. And one of the elders stood there and he broke it. And then he laid it down on the plate. And he said, I want you to remember this. This is my body, which is broken for you. I don't know whether you've ever had anybody that took pain for you, other than possibly our mother when we were born. <laughs> and what this meant, and the joy that she felt in the pain. And I can imagine the joy that Jesus felt in the pain because he did it for us. And when he did it, he took the bread and when he had broken it, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. Mitzi and I have both worked in a hospital for many, many, many years. Mitzi for 150, no, no. <laughs> Mitzi for for at least 65 years. In the time that I was there, so many times we saw blood. <coughs> the thing that impressed me so many times was when we would stand there and, and here would be this, this pedestal and here would be a transfusion. And this blood then was to come into the life of a new person. And this is exactly what we find in the communion. Say, this is my blood, which has been shed for you. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. I'm grateful for this morning. It's, uh, it's been a difficult week for, I know, many of the individuals within our congregation. And there's some kind of special prayer requests that we want to, uh, want to <coughs> give to each of you as we get into the time of prayer. But before we do, I'm going to ask you this. Do you mind if I take off my coat? No. I'm hot. <laughs> I See, Phil's got a... And, and so Jason, he, he's got a short sleeve. I, what I ought to do is get a short sleeve coat. How would that be? <laughs> but uh, I, I'm so grateful to, to be here this morning. And the kind of the things that, that we have now, see Marshall has turned these on. He's kind of hoping that my sermon notes will blow away. <laughs> but um, there are so many things. And I, you know, we, we talked about these, these fruit loops, and how, I don't know, do, do you realize how important church camp is? How many of you have ever been a student at church camp? How many of you have ever just been to visit there? You know, it was a great time, and I, I want you to know, you know as, I, as I look at this box, it, it reminds me, believe it or not, of the first time I went to church camp in Lake James in Angola, Indiana. We drove 220 miles. There were 60 of us from our church, 60 young people that went to camp that first year. 
Something special happened to me that day. That's the day that I gave the Lord my life to become a minister. I've talked to individuals about tractors this morning. I talked about all of these things in my the time when I, I wanted to be a farmer. But something happened on that day when I gave my life to the Lord as a minister. And I know that we can do the same thing for a lot of young people. Maybe they aren't in within our group, but they are someplace, and we can influence them to serve within the army of the Lord. How important and very significant this is. There are things that we can remember in prayer. And we as a congregation, you know, you know we, look, we look at our congregation this morning, and, and you know, folks, I, I guess I'm just going to talk to you for just a moment. Mitzi says, you know, your introduction is so long sometimes. Why don't you just get to the sermon? <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that quite this morning. But, you know, some of the things that are so important, you know, look at this piano. They're doing a great job with the recorded music. But the Lord has provided this piano. Let's pray for someone to come and play it. Let's do that deep within ourselves where the gift God has given someone, man or woman, to play this instrument to his honor and glory and to lead us in singing. Why can't we pray for that? The congregation, I, I've looked at pictures. I've gone through the files. You'd probably be surprised at the things that I've learned in going through the church files. And so many of the pictures are, are pictures of 10, 20, 30 young people. Where are they? Where are they? Let's pray for young people. Let's pray for this place to be full and overflowing. That some way as this pandemic has gone away, that there's some way that we can reach other individuals to worship, to find the strength that is present in God. Our country is at a spot where we don't know where our strength is. We don't know what's happening. But we do know that God can change anything. And he will answer our prayer. I've got a couple of prayer requests this morning. We've got two empty seats back here this morning that are always full on, on Sunday. And that's Janice McDade and also Sharon Key. Is that right? Yeah. Sharon yeah. Key. Karen. 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 But these two individuals, and both of them are very, very ill today. Let's keep them in our prayers. That some way they will be healed. And that that beautiful blanket can be around somebody very, very soon. Let's keep them in our prayers. Also, Charlene Winkins, sister, uh, Maria, Marcia, Marcia, Marcia Bryan, uh, that she's having surgery, has tumor, a tumor behind her eyes. She's in ICU right now. She was taken to ICU. And let's keep her in our prayers. And let's keep Charlene in our prayers too. When it's your sister, something is so, so urgent, isn't it, that we can care for that. And then also, uh, many of you know this individual, I, I believe. Our, our, my, our grandson happens to be the one that farms his ground. It's David Harper. David was killed, yes, this last couple of days. I'm not yesterday. sure exactly what day. Yesterday yes. was killed uh, as he was working on some machinery. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's keep David and his family, David Harper, uh, in the days that are ahead. And then also, I really want us to say, and I'm not trying to embarrass, but I, I, I'm so grateful <clears throat> for Jason and Jerry. If there's no other reason that I ever came, I know I did. I wasn't the one that did this, but I was able to enjoy 
the baptism of, of these two men. I'm so grateful for the strength that I receive and that this family, that this church receives. Yes. Could you pray for Judy, uh, Judy and, and uh, Pat Albert? They're, they're both sick. Okay. As we know, they hadn't been here because they're both sick. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah. I didn't get a hold well, of that, yeah, Judy. Yeah, that's it. And then she. Yeah, now she's sick, sick too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, let's keep Pat and Judy in our prayer. She, they usually sit right there. So you'd have to move over just about one person in order for them to be there. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so let's keep Pat and, and Judy in our prayer. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Prayers of Thanksgiving. I have a young lady I work with, Stephanie Wolf. She's 23 weeks pregnant and she's on bed rest now. She's high rest. So keep Stephanie in your prayers. Okay. Del? There's one that uh, I wrote about. People that we are aware of who consider it to me. Each other's needs. Okay. Let's take a moment and bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dear Father, this morning we, we really kneel within our hearts before you because of the love and the care that you have given to each of us, because of the sacrifice that you made of your son. <coughs> there are so many things on our hearts this morning, Father. I pray especially those within this body that that are ill, that are in the hospital, that are unable to take care of themselves, may they know your presence. I pray that there will be healing. We also pray, Father, that you will lead us, that as a family, we may be able to influence, and strengthen, and give life to so many. Thank you for the sacrifice that you have made in your son. I pray, Father, that you will bless the, the camp at Lemoyne as they prepare to, to work with young people this summer. That maybe lives have been changed, that there are men or young men or young women that will want to enter the ministry in some way. We need that so badly, Father. And I pray, Father, that, that you will bless us in the task that we have here at home. That we'll be able to, to bring back those that have, have worshipped here before and have just walked away. Father, may the presence of your spirit be evident. Please care for us. Strengthen us. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. As you notice uh, in the bulletin and also in the words that I have used in the last couple of weeks, this will be the, the second of five sermons in a series. I cannot remember uh, the last time that I really ever did a, a series of sermons. <laughs> I, I just, for some reason, just don't do that. But I, I, I want especially for us to think about uh, the, the message, the message of, of grace, because if there's anything that we need within, within our lives and within within our relationships as Christians. It's, it's this matter of grace, this gift that is there. And it's not something that we just hand to another person and say, here is grace. But it's the spirit that is, that is within us as individuals. And we think about it. The biblical pictures of God's grace in action. And I'll be using some of the terms that I used last week to, to describe grace a, a little bit later on in the message. But I think there are so many passages of Scripture that really talk about, about grace and talk about where, where God is and, and how he is uh, involved. And the one that I especially want to look at this morning is in the, in the book of John, chapter 4. And I, I love I have John uh, writes. I love the things that we find in, in John and, and in, the, in the gospel narratives because 
uh, these are these are stories, but it's not it's not fiction. These are events uh, that have taken place. And I the one story that I used last week, if, if you remember, I mean here here's this woman in this massive crowd, and it's almost like you know she's she's down like this, and, and Jesus passes by, and she she's struggling, and she's trying to get through the crowd, and, and then all of a sudden she. She reaches up and, and she's able to touch the hem of his garment. And something happens. She's changed. And you know, a lot of times, I, I think, for some reason, at least for myself, it's as if I think I've got to take Jesus and put my arms around him. And when sometimes I think he may say, David, just touch that little thing at the hem of my garment and everything will be all right. We expect such great things to happen. Maybe evangelistic meetings, maybe songs, or, or a sermon, or a lesson, or something. And he's saying, just, just touch me, and everything will be all right. And that's what we find here in this lesson in John chapter 4. Now, I'm not going to read all of it at one time. I'm going to be reading uh, several of the verses as, as we go along that are really uh, so important. Now, I, I don't know if, you, if you've ever thought about this, but do you realize that water is an act of grace? <laughs> Got my bottle of water right over there. But can, have, any, have any of you ever been in a desert? I, you know, one of the things as we look about it, as, as John is writing this, this passage of Scripture, the fact that God has given us water to satisfy a thirst. And the comparison that I want to make here is, I think that there are times within all our lives when we are thirsty or hungry, maybe we use that term more, but we are hungry for the gospel. We are hungry, you know, and Mitzi and I, we kind of experienced this when we moved here. One of the things that I enjoy more than anything else other than church is the symphony. Is to sit back and listen for hours to the symphony. And as we look at this, I was hungry for that. I'm hungry for the symphony. But I have been away, believe it or not, from church for one week. And I am hungry for the message that we find here. I'm thirsty for it. And the only way that this is going to be satisfied is that if we take the grace of God as that water that is going to take care of the thirst. But in the middle, you know, we find here in the scriptures, you know, so many times, here they are in the middle of the desert. They're camping out in the sand. The degree, it's 135 degrees. And all they have is, a, is something that is going to give them a little bit of shade. And the desire is for water. And what do they get? They get hot water. But it satisfies the thirst. And you think about what we have. Think about where we are. You know, there was no air conditioner there. They couldn't even take off their coat, you know, like we did, or like I did, and be comfortable. There's no refrigerator out there where we could keep the water cold or anything like that. The wind was blowing around and the sand and everything else, and yet they're there. And they felt like there was no relief. And you know, the thing that I have found over the years is this very thing that so much of our society, and I, I guess I'll talk about news or something a little bit. As, as I listen to the news, I just want to hold my hands and I don't want to hear anymore. I don't want to hear it. I don't want it to come into my heart and into mind at all. There is no relief. And yet the very thing that we find in the word of God is saying, my grace will give you relief. And the greatest part about this subject of grief or of, of grace is so important. In John 4, we find it, it's known, you know, as a story of, of, of a woman, she was at the well. And I, I love that picture. Here is the woman that has gone uh, to the well. 
But more important, it, it's a story really of grace. The story shows us, you know, so many qualities. And I'm going to use five of them this morning. Five qualities of God's grace. And the most important, as we look at verse 3, it is so important. It tells us that Jesus was on his way from Judea to Galilee. And in verse 4 says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. We don't really know what that means. Well, except maybe we do in a little bit. He had to go through Samaria, the, the, the closest thing that was there. But you know the strange thing about it, the Jews wouldn't go through Samaria. They would take the long way around. Have you ever done that? Gone around, you know, uh, I'm originally from Saginaw, Michigan. I have a sister that lives in Detroit, and Mitzi and I liked to go to Canada once in a while. And the hard thing was we didn't want to go through downtown Detroit. It was terrible. And that's been 25, 30 years ago when we did that. And so we found a way around. Where we, did, we would go all the way up around Detroit and up north and then go across the lake into Canada. And here we find this very thing that we, when we think about it, we think about, about grace. The important thing, it is not something that we had to hunt for. And isn't this a strange thing when you think about it? It is a matter of, of all of us this morning who think, I've got to find grace. Here is Jesus. And he said, I will treat you with grace. I'm looking for you. Have you ever been lost? I've, I've been lost in this. I was lost in Jerusalem at one time. I, I was lost in other places. And the panic was there. And then all of a sudden, I here was this little lady by the name of Mitzi. It <laughs> says, I've been looking for you. And I found you. And here is Jesus. He isn't saying, hey, I'm going to hide over here in the corner, and if you're lucky, you're going to be able to find grace. He said, I'm looking for you. I'm doing everything I can to find you, to take care of you, to help you, to bring your life. Jesus didn't play that game with us at all. He went right into the middle of town here as he, as he goes around in this city. And all of a sudden, you know, he arrived in this town of Sychar. And he sat down next to a well. And in verse 7, it tells that a Samaritan woman came to draw water from the well. And you know, it, was, it says it was in the, in the middle of the day. If we look at that scripture and we understand the, the clock and so on, in the middle of the day. And there was a reason why she did it in the middle of the day. Because if she did it in the morning, everybody else would have been there. She had five husbands, and the one that she was with wasn't even her husband. Here is a woman that is an outcast. Nobody liked her. Nobody wanted to even be around her, to touch her, to associate. And so she comes to the well at noon when nobody else is going to be there. And all of a sudden, here is this man named Jesus. And can you imagine, have you ever had anybody kind of ask this of you? Uh, maybe in, in, in a little different words or different needs. Here is Jesus comes up and he says, um, could you give me a drink of water? And she kind of, what? You're asking me? I mean, the only time a Jew ever talks to me is when they need something. <laughs> what can I give you? You're asking me for water, and I don't even have water. And then she gets the water. And the grace really is there. She waited until everyone, everyone had, had gone. They had gotten their water. And this passage, as we look at it, you know, these five husbands and the, the, the quality of our... And you know, the thing that concerns me so many times 
as Christians and as churches and even as evangelists in our message, it says you've got to be perfect before you can come to the Lord. And that's not true. We come to the Lord because he has invited us and because we need it. Why do you go to a doctor? Well, I usually go because I feel sick. When I get well, I don't go to the doctor. I don't need to. But here is this woman that stands before Jesus in this sixth hour. And Jesus, he asks this of an unclean woman to draw him some water. And as we look in verse 9, it tells us that she asked him that very question that I, but how is it that, that you, being a Jew, ask a drink? from a Samaritan woman. I'm an outcast. You don't even want to be around me. It's almost a sarcastic statement, I think, that she gives. It, it's like she's asking, why is it that you Jews want nothing to do with us, with us Samaritans, unless you need something? And is this what happens so many times within the church? We say, the only time you come to church is when you need something. Great. I want to give it to you. And this is exactly what Jesus did not take offense at this statement. He intends, as we will, he proceeded to meet her needs. And isn't this what we must do as the church? Not what you can do for the church. And that may sound strange. Because I know there are so many lessons that we have given, but what can the church, and I, I look at every one of you, what can the church do for you? What can Jesus, our Lord, and our Savior, what can I as a minister, what can these men as an elders and you as women as a Bible study, what can we do for you? How can we help you? And what this means within the life of the individual. God wants to show you favor. I love that. As we see this woman in the needs that she had. It was under, and the words that I used last week in the message were these very words. It is undeserved, unmerited, unexpected, unexplainable, and unbelievable. God's not waiting for you to get your life straightened out before he gives you grace. He is at the well. I love this. He is at the well, ready to give us the water. And if we don't feel like God is with us, do you think, I think this is kind of, a, I, I know it's kind of a joke we go around. Do you think he's moved? He hasn't. Can you imagine? Here's this woman standing at the well, and here is Jesus. And he asks her for water. Do you think that he moved? Not at all. And I don't think that that's a very... So many times we move when a request has been given. Great. And this is the second thing I want. Grace is refreshing, isn't it? I've got this bottle, I've got this bottle of water over here, and we think about what water does for us. It refreshes us. And I can just picture this woman, you know, coming to a well with her head down and, and how she felt. And, and all of these things, she had lost her marriages, she had lost everything, she was alone. And it doesn't matter. And when we look at this, many people that you love, it takes to toll on us. It becomes hard to find a reason to keep going. And you know, that's I think that's what's happening within our country now. What is the reason to keep going? It's because of the grace that God has given us. In 4, verse 13 and 15, when Jesus is talking to her about the living water, we see a refreshing quality of God's grace. Here, and people spend their lives trying to quench that thirst. You know, I... I suppose this is an arrogance on my part, but you know, I, I've, I've been a counselor. I was, I was a, a, a counselor uh, 
so in a sense, a psychiatrist at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, at the, at the state uh, mental institution. And the people there, their lives were falling apart. And they were hungry for something, or they were thirsty for something, and they didn't know what. And I, men and women, I think that even in our own town, I think that there are men and women that are hungry and thirsting for something, and they don't know what it is. And some way, we as a church, as the body of Christ, as we are standing here, really must deliver this to the rest of the world. That's the same way with God as we look at it. You know, in reality, our, our stuff is junk. I, I think about myself, you know, how many times have you thought of yourself as a kid? And, and the, how many, the things that you went after? <laughs> I can remember, you know, now, kids now are looking for computers and for things like that. But I, I remember, oh, you know, I wanted so bad was a basketball. I lived out in the country, and, and I wanted a basketball, and I wanted a bike. I never had a bike before, and I wanted one uh, so badly. And, and I remember before that, I wanted a wagon. How many of you ever wanted a, you remember these, these radio flyer wagons? Oh, I don't know if I could. And Dad, you know, for Christmas, don't get me one that has anything else on it but radio flyer. <laughs> I want that wagon and, and what it meant uh, to me. I, I, I want a BB gun. I never got a BB gun. <laughs> never did. I wanted a knife. I could hang it on my belt. I didn't have a belt, so I never got a knife. <laughs> I wanted all of these things when I think about it. And this is the same way sometimes with God in reality. All our stuff is junk. I didn't need that stuff. And I, I'm probably like some of you. I talked to my son-in-law who, who was a fantastic man when it comes to investment. And he's, he's 62 years old and he's going to retire in July. How about you, jerk? <laughs> I mean, I'm 83 and you're going to retire and I'm still working? <laughs> but I look at that and I think there's something that money isn't going to satisfy each other. And neither is golf or the other things that are there. There is something that is down within our hearts and our lives that belongs to God and we hunger for this deep relationship to Him no matter where we have been within our lives. The grace that God is giving us is the only thing that will really quench our thirst and our hunger. And I mean that. If you don't get anything else in all of the time that I'm with you, please know the only thing that is going to satisfy what the longings that are in it is this relationship to Jesus Christ, to God. And then the hunger is satisfied. The thirst is taken care of. And then, then the next thing is this, that grace is eternal. Now, I, I've been like many, probably many of you, I've invested and I thought, hey, this is going to last forever. And then on Tuesday, the money goes away. There's so many things that I have bought that don't last. But the one thing that we find within the scripture that is so important, that when we sing it, who enter in the scripture in verse 14, says that whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him the fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is telling us here in this chapter that his grace is what? Eternal. It doesn't waste away like the radio flyer wagon or the bicycle or the knife or the BB gun or any of those things that you want. When we drink of God's grace, when we accept within our lives the living water that Jesus has offered, and that it is the result is this eternal life. 
Think about it. That's the answer. Our <laughs> country is hungry, and you know that. Our kids, my own kids, are hungry. If they just knew Jesus well, then they would know the eternal life that Jesus has to offer. God, grace is eternal. And this becomes open. You know, additionally, as we, you know, we notice that Jesus was not offering his grace to a woman who had her life in order. And isn't this a strange thing? And I hope you know, I'm going to go over a couple minutes today, but I want you to think about this. That Jesus wasn't offering this grace to people. He didn't say, okay, now, have you given your offering this week? Have you been baptized? I know don't, I don't want you to go away and say the preacher said you don't have to be baptized, you don't have to, I'm not saying that's what I'm saying. But he isn't saying that you have to be perfect, that you have to be good, that you have to have all of these things. He says you have to be thirsty. And I will give it to you. I will make you perfect. Even if you get a, a huge, giant, uh, temporary thing within you. You know, how many... <laughs> I can remember as a kid, uh, when I would go downtown uh, in, in Columbus, Indiana, we went to this place, was, we called it the Greeks. It was the Heracles. And I'd get this great big container that we would simply call it the lemon lime supper. I don't know what we call it. But all it was was ice filled with lemon lime flavor. And then you Take bars, and by the time you got out of the restaurant, your head hurt so bad because you had you drunk so much of the ice that you couldn't stand it. And and we think about you know we've all messed up when when we think about uh, our lives. God's grace and favor isn't based upon our performance and and all of the these things. The truth is that none of us deserve grace. Isn't that what grace means? We do not deserve grace. I'm sorry to tell you that. You don't deserve it. And I don't either. But the great thing is going to give it to us anyway. God comes through Christ. And that's the really the, the emphasis of home. One thing I love about this passage, it shows both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. Have you ever thought of that? Jesus comes to this well. He is the Son of God. And what does he say? He's thirsty. He's a human being. And at this point, he's asking for it. Sometimes we think as Christians that I'm not thirsty anymore. I'm a Christian. Baloney. We're all thirsty. We're all hungry. And it comes through the grace of God that this hunger and this thirst for what is good and will please us and allow us to sleep, that those things are there because of the grace of God. In Psalm 139, we find, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, what do you, they say, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, when there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me, if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Isn't this great? In other words, the grace is there and it is eternal. God knows where we are. He knows where we are. We're not lost. The last thing is this. Grace is for everyone. For everybody. I don't care who you are. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how good you've been. Or anything in between there. He's talking to the Samaritan woman. And Jesus makes a very strong point here. As to what's made. That grace is for her. At that particular point. The Jews of that day. Believed that they became. That because they were God's chosen race. That they were special. And I think in a way. We as Americans have said. We are special. 
God has blessed our nation. And that's right. But he goes to Africa, he goes to Russia, he goes to the people of Hamas, and he said, my grace is for you. And think of what this is. Did, did, uh, uh, have anyone noticed that kids, when they had a birthday party, they had you know, dozens of toys, but guess what they want? Friends in a, in a wooden box. And aren't we the same? They, we, and what do we think about the pandemic, everything is going, with everything that's going on now, the thing that we have missed the most is being with one another. That's why the suicides and so many things, because God has made us to be with one another. And I, maybe, you don't know what you've done for me, but you know what? God has given me grace through you. You believe that? But also, God gave you grace through me. And through mixing, and through those that happen to be around. In Galatians chapter 3, I want to close with these words. And, well, except for a little passage in the book of Corinthians. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. Isn't that important? It kind of upsets this idea of racism, doesn't it? And then here we find in Corinthians, for by my spirit we were all baptized into one holy, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, the grace of God. It's not a race that divides us at all. There's nothing that is status specific. It is anything that is a gender specific. Nothing there at all. It's not men or women or children or anything like that. This woman that we find here at the well did not think she deserved God's favor. You ever think about that? She didn't deserve it. She knew that. And she didn't. She was dirty. She was sinful. It's just the kind of person God was looking for. And that's where we are. Everyone, listen carefully. These are my last words. You are the kind of person that God is looking for. I don't care what you've been through or where you've come from. Jesus is at the well and it will satisfy your thirst. And we need that. I need my thirst and my hunger to be satisfied. And as we Present our hymn of invitation this morning. This is a part of the message of grace that we have. And let, let's just look at this, at this, this particular chapter that we have. You know, precious Lord, think how that how that must have felt of this woman as well. Precious Lord, take my hand. Let's stand. And we'll just sing the, the this first verse. And maybe, maybe if you really sing good, we'll sing the second. We hear especially on this verse, verse number 463. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. for your grace. May this hunger within us be satisfied. May it be eternal. Guide us as we go to our homes that we trust you, that we also may give grace to those around us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
I went 10 minutes over, so that means next week you'll get out of here 10 minutes early. Yeah. Right? God bless you.